to tell you the truth, I am a simple man and of little worth, striving only to give expression to the art which God gave me. In the arts of painting, sculpture and architecture, the Tuscans have always been among the best. Indeed, I may say that as Athens was the home of the sciences, so Florence is the cradle and home of the arts. And Florence was the city in Italy most worthy to nurture the genius of Michelangelo. This Michelangelo and I, when we were boys, would go into the church of Santa Croce to learn drawing from the paintings of Giotto. A citizen of Florence once found Michelangelo contemplating the works of Donatello. For many months he drew Masaccio's paintings in the church of the Camini. The boy's father, finding that he neglected his literary studies for drawing, used to beat him severely. But this was not sufficient to deter him. I record this first day of April, 1488, how I Lodovico Buonarroti, apprentice my son Michelangelo to Domenico Ghirlandaio to learn the art of painting. The master perceived that Michelangelo not only surpassed the other students, but also that he often competed on an equality with himself. So then the boy, now drawing one thing and now another, without fixed place or steady line of study, happened to be taken into the palace of the Medici. Lorenzo de' Medici, the ruler of the city, had adorned the palace with antique statues and other relics of art. When Michelangelo saw these things and felt their beauty, he no longer frequented Ghirlandaio's studio, but judging the Medici Gardens to be the best school, spent all his time and faculties in working there. Lorenzo, seeing his genius, accordingly gave him a room in the palace, and he sat at the same table with Ficino, Pico, and Poliziano listening to the dialogues on Plato and drinking in the golden poetry of Greece. On the advice of Poliziano, he carved about the year 1492 a fight between the lapiths and centaurs of such beauty that it seems the work of a consummate master and not of a youth. And so, 
At an early age, he found the work he loved best in the world, the carving of stone. Picture to yourself the genius of the city of Rome. that once at Rome, while I was sketching the column of Trajan, Michelangelo stopped to watch me. The Cardinal, while we were inspecting his collection of antique statues, said to me, Michelangelo, have you the courage to make some beautiful work of art? It was said that Michelangelo studied this antique torso to such a degree that he was wont to call himself its pupil. Now, that most learned Roman gentleman, Jacopo Gallo, employed Michelangelo to execute a marble Bacchus the Greek god of wine and revelry, of which, say the ancient Greeks, he was the first discoverer. The face of the god is jocund, the eyes wandering and wanton. In his right hand, he holds a cup, lifting it to drink and gazing at it like one who takes much delight in wine. Be it known that Michelangelo, sculptor of Florence, shall make for the sum of 450 gold ducats a pietà of marble. That is to say, a draped figure of the Virgin Mary with the dead Christ in her arms. And I, Jacopo Gallo, do promise that it shall be more beautiful than any work in marble to be seen in Rome today. Lombards were praising it loudly. One of them asked another the name of the sculptor. Michelangelo said nothing, but that night shut himself in the chapel with a light and his chisels and carved his name on it. Now some of Michelangelo's friends wrote from Florence urging him to return. It came about in this way. 
the board of works of the cathedral owned a piece of marble nine cubits in height, which had been brought from Carrara some hundred years before and blocked out by Master Agostino of Florence and badly blocked. Michelangelo, however, said that he could extract a good thing from the marble and it was offered to him. He accepted, added no pieces and carved his David, the slayer of Goliath. As I have said, it was the opinion of all that no one was capable of extracting a statue from the block and that it was useless for any good purpose. This revival of a dead thing was a veritable miracle. He also began a statue of St. Matthew, which, though it be roughly hewn, shows perfection of design and teaches beginners how to extract figures from the stone. Michelangelo's method in this matter was the best. Once satisfied with his full-size model, he took charcoal and sketched out the main view of his figure on the marble in such wise that it might be distinctly traced. Having thus sketched in the principal aspect, he began work by removing the surface stone upon that side, just as if he intended to fashion a figure in half relief. And thus he went on, gradually uncovering the rounded form. He often said that the statue dwelt already within the stone, held captive until released by his chisels. To break the marble spell is all the hand that serves the brain can do. Be it known that I, Michelangelo, sculptor, do hereby contract for the delivery of 60 loads of marble, free from cracks and veins, from the quarries of Carrara. Be it known that the said marbles are required for the tomb of His Holiness, our Lord Pope Julius. Well then, after quarrying the blocks which he deemed sufficient, he had them brought to Rome. The quantity of stone is enormous. It stirs amazement in the mind. To give some notion of the colossal tomb, I will say that in its niches are to stand over 40 statues representing the arts, sciences and laws mourning the death of their most noble patron, Pope Julius. The Pope is now unwilling that I should work on his tomb and has ordered me to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. In vain have I told him that painting is not my trade. I live here in a state of dissatisfaction, not over well, and working on designs for the chapel. I waste my time without results. God help me. I hasten the designs as much as possible, for it seems that I've been here a thousand years. Beloved Father, know that I have finished the chapel which I have been painting. The Pope is very satisfied. Your son in Rome, Michelangelo, sculptor. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. 
And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Now, on completion of the painting of the chapel, the Pope directed that his tomb be finished, but on a smaller scale than at first proposed. Michelangelo readily began it anew. I saw Michelangelo at work. In one quarter of an hour, he caused more splinters to fall from a very hard block of marble than three young stonemasons in three or four times as long. He attacked the work with such energy and fire that I thought it would fly into pieces. With one blow, he brought down fragments three or four fingers in breadth and so exactly at the point marked that if only a little more marble had fallen he would have risked spoiling the whole work. On returning to the tomb of Julius then he worked ceaselessly but envious fortune could not allow him to complete the monument he had begun so superbly for Julius now died Pope Leo, the successor to Julius, visiting Florence, his native city, contemplated the church of San Lorenzo with its unfinished facade. Well then, I feel it in me to make this facade in such a way that it shall be a mirror of architecture and sculpture for all Italy. But Pope Leo must make up his mind quickly whether he wants me to do it or not. I'm getting to be an old man. I must have some answer before I get any older. And besides, seeing that I'm pressed to continue my work on the tomb of Julius, the Pope must make some arrangement. I do not account for the three years of my time which have been thrown away on this work. I do not account for this most disgraceful act of bringing me here to do this work and then taking it away from me. To return to Michelangelo. After wasting much time in Florence, first on one thing and then on another, he was commanded by the new Pope, Clement, to begin work on the Medici Chapel. A 
of this time, he did seven statues for the chapel, moved thereto more by fear of Pope Clement than by love for the Medici. Much wonder was excited by the figures. They are executed in wonderful attitudes. Giuliano, with bold head and deep-set eyes. Duke Lorenzo, in thoughtful pose. But what shall I say of Dawn, with her melancholy spirit? What shall I say also of night? In her, we see not only the quiet of the sleeper, but the sorrow of one who has lost something noble and great. I am now engaged in the service of the new Pope, Paul III, and working on designs for the painting of the Last Judgment, which prevents me from finishing the statues for the tomb of Julius. Every day I am stoned as though I had crucified Christ. My youth has been lost, bound hand and foot, to this accursed tomb. Now Pope Paul, wishing to employ Michelangelo on some noteworthy work, visited him, attended by eight or ten cardinals. He inspected the statues for the tomb of Julius, everything in detail. The Cardinal of Mantua, standing before the statue of Moses, cried out, This alone is sufficient to do honour to the memory of Julius. So ended the tragedy of the tomb. And though, truth to tell, it is but a botched-up remnant of Michelangelo's youthful design, the monument is still the finest to be found in Rome, if only for the statue of Moses. Worthy of all admiration is the statue of Moses, leader of the Jews. He sits, posed in the attitude of a thinker and a sage, 
holding beneath his right arm the tables of the commandments. His face is full of vivid life and spiritual force, fit to inspire both love and terror, as perhaps the man in truth did. He bears, according to the customary wont of artists portraying Moses, two horns upon the head. It is a marvelous work and full of art. To my dear friend at Florence, Messer Giovanni Fatucci, with regard to the old age which bears upon us equally, I should like to hear how yours is treating you, for I do not like mine very much. At the present time, suffering much from sleeplessness, he rises often from bed and takes up his chisels. He has in hand a work in marble, Christ taken from the cross. Michelangelo has portrayed himself in the person of Nicodemus, his face looking down with a tenderness beyond expression. I told Balducio he was to send lime of good quality. That which he sent is inferior. There's no question about it. He must take it back. At length, the Pope, inspired, I believe, by God, commanded Michelangelo to take up the post of architect to the Holy See. In vain did the master plead that architecture was not his art. God is my witness how much against my will it was that I began this work on St. Peter's. But now that there is money in hand and the work is really progressing, I mean to complete it. One night during the last years of his life, with terrible blows he was breaking the stone. His criticism of his own work was so severe that nothing he did satisfied him. However, his servant Antonio rushed into the studio in time to save the group from utter destruction. Although roughly hewn, it is a masterpiece, worthy in every way to stand among the master's works, both marble and fresco, which have lighted a lamp for art, casting abroad luster enough to illuminate the world for ages to come. <laughs> 